everybody. Welcome to another Wiser Wednesday. So great to have you back. Um, this week we're talking about rocketing revenue, so from solopreneur to CEO. Um, look, I, yeah, a bit of an intro. I'm James Potton. For those that don't know, don't know me, uh, I believe in a world of entrepreneurial success without burnout. Um, you know, got quite close to the flames a few times. Um, <clears throat> revenue is a really interesting topic. It's obviously what a lot of people to some extent think the business is about, uh, you know, that's why you start a business. Um, you know, maybe there's elements of uh, that, like just sheer focus on trying to achieve revenue that um, can sometimes not actually achieve revenue. So, you know, we're gonna try and delve into it today, see what is working and what isn't working in, in uh, you know, the up-to-date world of like PPC, like sales techniques, personal branding, um, you know, going out there and finding out what's actually happening and what's working for other people. Um, again, we're, we're all change again here in the UK. So we've had an interim PM, as it were, um, that, you know, <clears throat> that the, the, the interim government tried to drive for growth. And it's really interesting because maybe they tried to drive for growth at the wrong time. Um, you know, things weren't balancing on the books. And it's very similar within businesses, right? You get a similar kind of problem. If you don't, if you're not ready and you can't even got a scalable product, it makes things really hard. So, um, yeah, and look, and I've worked in both growth organizations, self-funded, um, they, they each each has its own place. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more as well. So um, if you um, have time in the chat, like if you can add in, you know, what you would do if you, would dub if you doubled your turnover, you know, what would you spend that on? And what would you, um, you know, what, what could your business be if you actually managed to do that? Um, I and mean, it's really possible, by the way, and even more like, you know, you get these things right, it absolutely fly. So let me introduce the panelists first. Um, we've got April um, Spritz from, uh, she's founder of, of Driven Outcomes. She's based in Florida, XVP uh, and um, of sales and host of the winning Mindset Mastery podcast. April once hosted NASCAR race from Afghanistan uh, for Fox News whilst in the Air Force. So you're driven indeed. So really excited to hear from you today. Uh, Mark Brook, you're head of uh, digital growth at uh, ClickMarge, um, a Google partner. So you're from Montreal. You're based out in Poland now. Um, you have over 5 million under your belt in ad spend. And, you know, you love to collect um, scale models of trucks from the 70s in your spare time. So keeping the driving theme going. Um, Jose uh, Uka, you're a public speaking coach, TEDx speaker, uh, based uh, out of London, um, and you believe in a world uh, that those who dare to mess it up and fail are on the right track to excellence. And uh, I really love that. I mean, it is, I, I align to it. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's just that's how you actually really like shift in, in, in who you are. So loving, lo really looking forward to hear from you today. And uh, Nitan Jain, your co-founder of Vazel based in India, built a social media analytics tool. Uh, you also advise on um, all things strategy within marketing. You've got over 3000 users. You're a movie buff. You prefer like 50s and 60s films. Um, and if the storytelling's there, you're up for it. Um, and you're 39, you're concerned you're going great. Uh, by the way, I think my dad went great at 15. So you're looking great. Um, so look, as I say, really excited to hear from the panel. Um, as to set the mood, uh, bun fights are fun night. So if you've got questions, you can like ask each other, like jump in, respect when someone's talking. We're live, so no swearing. Um, and uh, yeah, passion is welcome. So um, to begin with, let's let's um, share. Um, I start with Jose. Can you like give us an insight? One minute, like how you got to where you are today. Failing a lot. <laughs> that would be the summary of it. I've been failing since I decided to to leave my country, Venezuela, and even back then. So that is something that's been very important, building the resilience in order to be ready to make mistakes. But every mistake has taken me to a greater place. It's just the steps, step after step after step, but it's actually failure after failure after failure. Of Love course, it. it's not just failing for the sake of it. Fail. Yeah really reflect on the learning, apply, get ready for the next one. It's amazing. Okay, thank you, Jose. It's, um, yeah, it's weird, like, you know, anyone and everyone around this table and probably listening will know what it's like to, you know, that feeling of failure is, um, and different cultures approach it in different ways. Like, you know, I see the US being far more like familiar with it than maybe the UK, like there's a real fear of it. So uh, releasing that fear is so important. So yeah, great great to hear it. Uh, Nitan, you're up next. Tell us about your journey to, to, to today. So uh, if I have to uh, describe my journey in one word, that would be persistence. 
so uh, in the last eight years or so uh, and pivoting of course so we we started with the digital marketing agency we have we worked as an it firm we uh, built softwares for other people but uh, uh, right now uh, in the last eight years we have pivoted like multiple times but two things got us going persistence and we know that we are on the right track we will get it there so going forward right now we are handling like millions of dollars in ad spend and an agency and i can see that my customers are across the world in terms of saas product so if you are uh, if you are thinking that you don't have to pay salaries to your customers uh, to your uh, you know uh, teammate next month or maybe next quarter just hang in there you will find some work and and be persistent brilliant thanks it's um mark you're up next yeah so on my side we started off with uh well i started doing websites when i was 16 years old so <laughs> it's quite a journey uh at this point i'm 38 uh and it took time but i've done so many projects and just like jose i failed so many times until finally something succeeded um eventually you know it got into this agency mode where i was literally doing uh, video explainers for uh, startups and uh, from there, people just asked us, hey, can you also do websites because you do really beautiful explainer videos? So we started just getting really senior people on the team. And when you pay people really well and you got the top talent, then you can move uh, into next uh, niches instead of this business. So, you know, from one thing to another, we got into digital marketing and uh, with very creative minds. Like at this point, the team is 40 strong. And uh, it's growing, like we're literally driving growth uh, for SaaS's local businesses. Uh, oh my God, like pretty much, you know, the consultants out there, uh, solopreneurs out there. And it's, it's really fun to, to be with them from day one and see them grow also. So it's been a really wild experience so far. <laughs> awesome, great, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, that's awesome growth. Like, so, you know, so, so meta in itself, you know, um, April. So I grew up in poverty here in the U.S. And the one word that would describe me is just belief. And that belief took me into the United States military and then the financial industry where I would turn around different areas of the company and then to a really successful fintech startup where I was helping to build the sales organization. Started my firm about six years ago and now I am accelerating businesses, whether that's a turnaround and someone losing half a million dollars a year in revenue to going to profitable in six months and an almost nine figure sale in two years or helping scale from six million dollars a year in revenue to a seven billion dollar IPO. So the big thing here and the takeaway for the CEOs and the solopreneurs that are watching is everything wasn't done right the first time. Jose loved the idea of failure. You can always pivot and fix things from where you are. You just have to believe that you can get there. And hopefully some of the things I'll share about the fact that I'm not smarter or more special than anyone else. It's really based in that mindset of belief. Everyone will leave this call and this live knowing that they can do it too. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, everyone, for your, your intros. Um, I guess like following on from, from for you, April, um, <clears throat> I was starting out with like driving or trying to scale too soon. So love to hear from you. Uh, you know, what do you think is the biggest mistake you see when businesses try to scale too early? So I think that it depends on your business. If you're in a, a service-based business, sometimes scaling early is a little easier. You can pre-sell, you can adjust things on the fly, but certainly when you're in a product situation, whether that be SaaS software or an actual physical product, you've got to make sure that what you're putting into the marketplace is pleasing the people who have it. And the best place to get feedback on that is from your current clients. And if you have, and you know, in the software industry, they say, if you're not embarrassed when you launch it, you've done it too, too, or, or too late, right? You should do it before then. But having that candid conversation and those open dialogues with your clients when you think maybe you haven't hit the mark and getting that feedback from them on how you can make it better is going to build more trust and, and candidly expand your internal sales force because having that kind of relationship and understanding that you really care about their experience is going to make them evangelists for your product or service great great um is, is jose have you got a, a thought on this what, what you've seen when people try to scale too early look i haven't got plenty of experience in terms of scaling businesses 
but definitely what I, what I perceived is actually having that opportunity to run the product. I was actually, I wrote some notes before the call, by the way. And I was thinking, whenever you're getting a product out there, it is for a service. It is because you want to solve a problem and having that clarity. So is it solving the problem? I need to link it to what April said. If it's solving the problem, but the best thing to do is just have to have good conversations, even if you're getting started with the people within your environment that are potential clients that could benefit from what you've got to offer. So it's actually, I would say feedback. I'm not really going to elaborate more on that because that is a key piece. And yeah. again, not my biggest strength. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. No, great. I mean, that feedback, this kind of learning from the future, not the past as well, the agile mindset and when you're trying to, you know, grow a business is super important. So yeah, that, that feedback loop in both directions is, 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 is key. Um, Mark, how about yourself? Yeah, so I think uh, the biggest impact that uh, startups have when they're trying to scale is actually the budgets uh, for the scaling. Uh, what I've seen from my clients, and we deal with so many uh, different client sizes, um, you know, the budgets that they have for advertisements uh, sometimes are way too small, or the teams that they put in place are just not skilled enough. Um, and it's unfortunate, like what we see when we come into settings uh, on analytics, on Google ads, on Facebook, uh, you know, there's no foundations and they tr they're trying to scale uh, non-optimized CPA channels. So, uh, and for those that don't know, CPA is just a cost per acquisition. Uh, so, you know, when you're trying to scale your business, you first have to drill down your KPIs. So something like your cost per lead, cost per acquisition, cost per sale. And these are the foundations that I'd say 95% of, uh, of our clients actually don't understand. So uh, they do know how many sales they got. They do know their you know, audiences and whatnot, but it's not enough. You have to pinpoint the mathematics behind it and then try to optimize each channel before you try to scale. So that is something that we really focus on with our clients. It's really the base, uh, you know, the foundation of everything. Like uh, just today, I was with a client that makes about $300,000 a month um, and they don't have proper uh, algorithmic triggering, which is ridiculous, uh, because when you think about it, if he would have optimized uh, his signals, he would then have way more conversions, for example, on Google and Facebook, et cetera. So, you know, just basic stuff like that. Uh, so I'd say get your KPIs in place before you even start scaling. Awesome. All right, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, and look, I guess that I sort of see the growth journey in early stage businesses is you, you start with the product, then you go to promote and there's like that learning cycle there. Then you kind of get into more complexity where you're building processes and adding people. So I suppose at the end you end up with power, which, you know, you should wield like carefully. Like, But so earlier stage, like Nitan, it'd be interesting to hear your views on, you know, what are the, some of the considerations that our founders should have regarding like product market fit? You're on, uh, I think you're on mute. So before we think of scale, I guess uh, the one thing that we all need to figure out is, is that my uh, I'm near my product market fit or do I have a, my product market fit? So as Mark right, uh, rightly said, when I uh, uh, talk to my clients on D2C space or on e-commerce space, so I, I noticed that uh, some of them want a rapid scaling, but but their platform is not up to the mark. I mean, there are some basic glitches in the platform. They are, the tracking is not set up. So if, if you want to scale your uh, e-com business or any business, I think the fundamentals need to be placed. So for uh, to, to give you an example, so if you are in an e-com business, your uh, platform needs to be fixed. It, it has to work smoothly. Your payment gateways need to be fixed. I mean, it cannot be the case that somebody is trying to purchase it's not working. And the lastly, your delivery. Uh, I mean, the, you have to ensure that customer get the right experience. Uh, because it doesn't matter if you serve 10 customers or 100, the customer experience has to be awesome, right? So, you know, brands like the bigger brands like Amazon. So, the, I guess the biggest reason people order from Amazon is, is that uh, their service that you know that, okay, this will be a guaranteed delivery in certain time. So, that's where scale comes and that's where I would repeat purchases comes. So, I always ensure that please hit the scaling accelerator if you have the right uh, processes in place, if you have the right uh, uh, KPIs in place, as Mark said. So these are the two things I guess you need. And of course the product. So you have to figure out that I'm selling the right product or not before we, you know, uh, burn money on ads or before we start scaling. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Look, no, I love it. And, um, yeah, like bad reviews are a fast way to, um, to not scale. So you've got to be really careful on that front. Um, and also 
building something that is scalable because of it keeps requiring more and more people to deliver. So understanding that sales cycle versus the delivery cycle and, and you know, it is, you know, it is a bit of engineering or whatever in it, a systems design, isn't it? It's how do you actually get them in unison? Um, and if I may, yeah. Does, yeah. Yeah. yeah, James, I uh, wanted to also, also mention something extremely precious. Um, you know, the first month when you're scaling with, with uh, digital channels, uh, usually what you're doing is you're purchasing data. You're not doing anything else except purchasing data. And people, uh, what they actually expect is they pay Google, for example, in the first month, and they expect everything to just grow like rocket ship. But that's not how it works. How it works is that you're literally paying Google or Facebook for conversion data. And if you don't set up your conversions from the first month, you're just basically wasting all of your money. And uh, I want to basically explain something very, very important. Small businesses that have very small budgets, like $500 a month versus large businesses that have $300,000 a month. Um, these that have these huge budgets, they get their conversion data way faster. And this is the only key difference of success that I've spotted as a pattern with my clients. So uh, basically, the less you spend, the slower as a turtle, your conversion data will come through. And mm. this is really, really important to understand because a lot of people are impatient after the first month and they tend to be like, oh my God, this business is not going to work. Uh, there's not enough conversions. Maybe Google's not for me. You have to chill and let it just do its job. Like you have to put in a lot of uh, financials in order to get some sort of return and try to understand your data. So just uh, mentioning this. Yeah, yeah. Really well, James, Sorry, I'd love to add. I'd love to add something here because I think for a lot of small businesses, when they hear from you, Mark, if you don't have more than five hundred dollars a month to spend on your ad spend, you aren't going to get good data, and it's not going to work for you. Some people are thinking, okay, well, then what is the option for me? How am I going to grow my business to get to that point? And they feel like they're in a catch twenty-two. And that's where I think it's very important to develop those early relationships with your customers and to do things to market organically through your own brand so that you can get to a place where your revenue and your profit is somewhere that you can afford to put a little more towards that budget and do that digital marketing. I think the scary thing for a lot of small business owners is on average, 50% of marketing works. We just don't know which 50%. And that can be terrifying when they have a limited budget, right? So <laughs> that is definitely something where I don't want folks to feel like, oh, gosh, well, then there's nothing I can do because I don't have a budget. You absolutely can. And the things that you do to take care of your clients and grow that market organically are going to let you go play with the big boys, if you will, and girls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it May dovetails I? nicely, Jose, you know, like, you, mm. yeah, we're moving into sort of, you know, the, the organic side of things in, in brands. Yeah. So, yeah, far away. Uh, Mark, you took me back to my early days when I started. And I remember I didn't consider finances that much and the importance of having cash flow, people. I mean, people watching this, I know you guys do know, it is so important. And then if you're going to be investing in ads, be sure that the product has already got some level of demand. And then the data you've just provided, I'm thinking just what uh, April mentioned, can I do it? I'm thinking back then, I would have heard you. Would I have been able to do it? And then something I've developed with time, and again, another invitation to people out there, there is the trial and error, okay? I've done Google Ads. I've done Facebook Ads. I've done Insta Ads. I paid for people actually hunting for leads. I think I've done it pretty much all. And then I've struggled with cash until I found, and that is something I'm proud of for my business. Nowadays, I, I do like to you know, be minimalistic about my approach to business now. I tried all of this, but I found one thing that really worked even throughout the pandemic, and it was to invest in my personal brand. I know there are businesses that invest in the brand of the business, and yet I would invite everyone out there, if you can invest in your personal brand, that will impact any other businesses that you have. I run another business with my brother around videos and that's impacting the, the brand I managed to build. But then how do you go about this? Yes, you start posting on social media, you start posting on all the different channels, you start writing blogs like crazy, you start looking at the SEO. Oh, goodness me. Yes, I was just growing loads of gray hair until... I started asking 
every time someone booked a call with me or every time, and I created the systems in the background, by the way, so all the lead captures and, you know, people will come to me, they will receive an email, all of that very much automated because I, I wanted to run my business by myself. So I would ask people booking the call with me, where did you hear about me? Oh, this publication. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Where did you find out about me? That publication. Where did you, the TEDx, where did the TEDx, the publication, the TEDx publication, TEDx publication. After 20, 30 people, I knew it was the TEDx and the publications, the PRs. And that's mm -hmm. what I've been doing for the last three years. And it's worked really well. Just investing on PR monthly, and I'm not talking about huge budgets. I'm actually, honestly, you're looking at the six, 700 pounds a month on the PR. And I've had people from Volkswagen Group, Procter & Gamble, Amazon reaching out because they want me to speak at their events. They want me to train their teams. They have a coaching opportunity. So my invitation to people out there, explore, but then do more of what works for you. And it will be very specific to your business. But to get to this point, I had to go out there and test. It was painful. That's why the failure thing is so big and important for me. But then eventually I started to streamline it. Yeah, and you know, look at my beer. It's actually holding there. It's not getting <laughs> any more gray. So that would be my contribution at this point on this. People look for the things that are working, do more of it, and stop doing the others. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. As I, uh, like, <clears throat> I guess that is uh, uh, like uh, running a business or like creating a business and trying to get it to grow is uh, a huge mirror back to yourself. So you have to go on that journey, a very painful journey of, well, how do I operate? You know, what's my sort of... You start to learn about the subconscious, your shadow side, stuff that you didn't know about yourself. It, it, it all gets laid bare. So, um, but understanding, you know, the positive aspect of that, which is your personal brand, is just so so powerful. Um, so yeah, lo lo love it. Um, is is uh, yeah? Does anyone else want to comment on what Jose has just said? Yes, so, uh, I actually I do. Whoops. <laughs> so uh, Nitan this time first. <laughs> So uh, I'm taking a cue from uh, Mark, uh, what Mark said, and then what Jose continued. So so let's say if somebody has a budget of $500, uh, dollars, right? So in, in digital marketing or in any marketing, uh, you will know that when you are talking to a marketer, uh, it, it's a very small budget to start with. And then Apple rightly asked that, uh, what, what should that guy do? So uh, my suggestion is that if you are uh, working in an uh, e-com industry or if you are selling a product, then uh, building your own brand is an expensive exercise. So I met uh, founders who are very passionate about their brand, very passionate about their product. But I would say that first launch that product on a marketplace, build some customers around it, get the early feedback that you can get in a marketplace, then start building your brand. Because $500 of ad budget on a marketplace is, is, is like $5,000 ad budget of on your own website because marketplaces are cheaper in terms of uh, ad spending. Obviously, uh, there will be like... Uh, commission of a marketplace and those things in place but that that journey can actually help you figure out the right product market fit and get you early customers before you start uh, focusing on your own platform so if you are tight on budget and you are in e-com e start with a marketplace build a, something like five six uh six dollars business there then you start uh, you know uh, taking out money and then starting building your own brand on the website so i guess that's one thing that that can be done yeah, you, you talk about your inner circle, like your close circles, don't you, Nitan? And then sort of like expanding out. So, um, and obviously, you know, we're we're talking across B two B, B two C here. So we've got like loads of different, um, yeah. you know, very different audiences in, in in how we operate. And yeah, like how you lead as a personal brand versus a business brand. That's really complex when you're running a consultancy and I'm stuck right in the middle of the two, which is the worst place to be personally. But um, Mark, what's, what's, what was your uh, thoughts on, on what Jose said? Yeah, absolutely. I think A-B testing is one of the best way of optimizing your CPAs. Um, just like Jose said, different channels have different CPAs and the same goes for your keywords, the same goes for your creatives, uh, pretty much your landing pages also. Uh, very important that let's say you're doing e -com, well, you have as much products as possible. So if you're doing like drop shipping and a lot of uh, customers are actually doing that, uh, it's good to have at least 500 products because then uh, the more products you have, 
of, the more SEO you capture from PPC. And what I mean by SEO is every product has its own little title. And the way that Google Shopping, for example, works is that it captures the keywords uh, inside of your products. So the more products you have, the more uh, keywords out there that you're capturing. And this is very important to understand. The reason is that eventually, let's say your month ends after 500 bucks spent on Google Ads shopping or whatever, you will see what type of country uh, or what type of region, what type of city costs the less to acquire. So you would then zoom in onto that specific location and try to scale it. And it's the same thing for your product. So if you see uh, the top five winning products, you have to isolate them into, like I call them fishnet boxes. Basically, we do fishnet discovery campaigns where we just do broad uh, discovery for which product actually sells really well. And then eventually we take those that are the best performers and capture them instead of a fish box and scale them because you know they're the cheapest one to acquire. So you would then scale these. So this is uh, something very important to do. And that's why A-B testing works really well. And just to tell you as a uh, an example, we ran this really interesting uh, LinkedIn campaign for one of our clients. And they were just testing out different brand names, but the same banners. So yellow background, just the brand name was different. And just the brand name made a huge difference in the click-to rate. So it's crazy, but we had 10x more clicks for a different brand name. So just play around with your name uh, so that it's catchy also when you're starting out and you're scaling. So yeah, that's my two cents on this. Right. Very brave to do it on LinkedIn, Mark. It's the most expensive place to, uh, to <laughs> do A-B testing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, a a April, did you have any sort of, um, yeah, sort of feedback on Yeah, I Sure, I would love to double down on what Jose said, because what he said about building your brand and the way he tested it, and I, I felt like that, Mark, he was A-B testing in his own way, right? These are the things that aren't working for my business. This is what it is. And I second what he said about building your personal brand alongside your business, even James, when it seems hard, because at the end of the day, no matter how savvy your marketing, no matter how great your product, we buy from people and companies we know, we like, and we trust. And what Jose is talking about is really giving people the chance to get to know you in that public way. And they've got to see you and understand who you are seven to 10 times before they're going to make that leap unless they have a huge problem. And I love what you said about hiring someone for PR, Jose. And I just want to put something out there for those people who are starting and they have those budgets that are really small. You can do PR for yourself. And I know in the U.S., there's a great company called Super Connect or media that trains people on how to represent their own brand, pitch themselves to publications, pitch themselves to television. And no one is going to talk more about the value that you offer with more authenticity and enthusiasm than you as the founder. So I just don't want folks to think if they don't have the budget for PR, they can't do what Jose did. It's more work. But hey, you're scrappy if you're an entrepreneur. That's why you got into this. James, may I? Of course, the floor is yours. April, yes, yes, fantastic, all of that. And I think, well, I think I know people watching this will benefit greatly from all of you. This is why, to complement that, April, I always, and this is what I do as a business with the coaching, is help people to communicate with impact and confidence, you know, their value proposition, what is it that they stand for, and then create a good signature talk or different talks that they can use on any platform, as long as they're speaking to the right audience, that's you know why I speak about the TEDx as being successful, not just the one talk I did, but then getting involved because then I put myself in front of that audience as a coach or even as a, as a host. So I co-hosted a few events as well through building these networks. April mentioned it, yes, the no like trust when you speak, even if you do five, to 10 minutes, it is very likely that you achieve those and even get people after the trust, even to believe in you, what you got for them, which is another way to build and develop your brand, your business. It will cost you time. But nowadays with the facilities we've got in place and the communications, it can be achieved without paying too much. Yes, there are, there are ways in which you can do PR as well. Reach out, I think that link, well, that, um, Website you provided, April, can be very valuable. And I had something else. Right. Going back to low budget. Mark, you pay and you get all of that data. 
Well, during the pandemic, my business just went like this, as I'm sure for many people may mm -hmm. have been the case or for any other people it grew. So I started and I decided to finally launch an online course and I posted it everywhere, everywhere on every platform. With Udemy, during that period of time, I reached over 40,000 students that signed up to that. Apart from the income I received without doing much, I got the data. I didn't have their email addresses, but I could actually email them and get them to connect with me. And I got to see where, which countries were demanding my, con my content the most and start targeting those countries via LinkedIn. So again, there are so many different ways in which you can get creative to get it started and make it successful. Oh, I just, I'm going to stop here. It's just, <laughs> I'm loving this. I'm loving this. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, look, it's so important. Um, it's, it's that, it's almost, you know, that sort of trigger going off in, in, in someone's head that they, there is, there are loads of options because you get bombarded a lot with, you know, the paid ads route and there, it, it, it you know, it's an expensive hobby if you don't, it's Mark saying, if you don't get it right, then it's, it, it really can just burn money. So, um, I'd say, uh, one thing here, James, um, if you have a small budget on the first month, what we can do is create your first initial touch points with your potential customers, with your brands. Um, so for example, the way that you could do this is usually uh, top of funnel channels like Facebook, they're the cheapest ones. Um, the reason being is that it's display and it's low on intent. Unlike search, when people are looking for something, uh, then it is the bottom of the funnel Basically, people already know about you, they're looking about you, or they have some sort of intent of maybe f uh, finding uh, something relevant to what you're offering. Um, so if you're purchasing traffic on Facebook and creating this initial touch point of your brand uh, for the eyeballs out there, which are uh, which is your audience uh, or potential customers, well, the next month you can do some remarketing on Google, for example, which is a little bit more high in intent, but you're using that uh, remarketing audience from Facebook that you've created at a cheaper cost. And then eventually on the second month, you're trying to talk to these people with your ads and you're, you're creating this second touch point. And this is really important. You need to have touch points in order to eventually make a sale. Mm -hmm. um, so people do recognize your brand. People do trust you eventually after seeing you all over the place, all over different publications. Uh, so that is definitely uh, an appeal to authority or appeal to cred credibility type of thing where people actually remember your brand and they associate authority with it and eventually credibility and possibly ma uh, they make purchases. So, yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting with that, because I stepped up to it and then stepped back to it from it again, because the for remarketing, you need, I don't know what it was, it's like a thousand, you need a certain number before remarketing works, right? It's, 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 a, I think it's a thousand in the last a thousand sessions. Yes. So, yeah. So it, it, even that, that that's going to cost something, isn't it? To get a thousand people to your site. But um, I, I, I hear you, Mark, that is a, that it's a, it might be a bit of a compromise and we can we can sort of come in come on come on to it has anyone got any thoughts or comments um kind of need to move the conversation forwards but yeah content content creation i quite like what you're saying jose which is it's you know if you 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 can with pr you can use that for the content as well you you, you it gives authority there's there's something like really powerful in it so um don't really want to move on but i think we're going to have to because the next bit is looking at like well okay you're starting to get leads in you know building a sales team and it's that tricky bit where should the founder do the sales do they start to look at um and this is obviously in circumstances where you need you know sales to to sell rather than it just being on the website um you know do they start looking at commission only sales people and then how do they start to develop that team so over to you yeah, absolutely. So I, I personally believe that any founder should be able to sell their product because no one is going to be the evangelist for it that you are. And I also think that it puts you in a unique position to hire good salespeople if you're not hiring someone to do something you're afraid of. Because just from a sheer mindset perspective, you cannot hire your way out of what your fears are because you won't be able to tell if that person is really going to be able to perform or not. So being able to get those reps under your belt to really learn what the message is, is going to save you a lot of time in scaling your sales team. So initially, 
I think the founder should be involved in those sales. And later down the line, even as you scale your sales team, then having that founder involved it closer to the end when you're looking to close the sale feels really good to early clients, to clients later on, and you can really add value at that point. As far as bringing on salespeople that are commission only, the only time that really works is when you have a company or product that has a short sales cycle. Because unless someone has been a super successful salesperson, they have a great savings, maybe they don't have a family, they're single, working for commission only is something someone would be able to do and willing to do for a few months, but then they're going to need to be compensated. And most of your best salespeople are used to having a decent salary, right? Even up to the six figures, if they're really good at what they're doing. Again, this depends on how high tier of something you're selling and then getting the commission on top of that. So it is really important, again, for the founder to be able to sell, to build up that level of revenue so they feel comfortable bringing on a salesperson. And I would also suggest that in the beginning, when you bring on those first salespeople, that you're selling together, both so you can coach and give them feedback, and also because at that, at that point, they're not going to have all the client stories that you do. They're not going to have the things to share that you will, and they'll learn them through selling alongside you. And then they can use those as our stories. We helped this client do that. We have seen this experience until they have their own stories from working with clients themselves. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, super interesting. So like that, that, that's the, the, the key message here is whether you like it or not, as a founder, you're going to need to get out there and, you know, get in front of clients because it isn't always like something that, you know, some, a lot, if you're working with specialists in something, they're really good at delivery, but they feel uncomfortable in that sales kind of role. 100%. So. And it, it's a big leap, but I will tell you that it is so worth the effort and overcoming that fear because the results that you get from that are incredible. And it's one of those things that if you absolutely don't think you can, then this is the time that maybe you tap someone else in your company who is better at doing that forward facing story. And maybe you go with them as the subject matter expert and they lead the quote unquote sales part. But ultimately, if we look at selling as helping people instead of selling people, right, you have a problem and I'm going to offer to help you with it, then it starts to feel better because people like to buy. And any of us who don't like sales, it's probably because we had a pushy, terrible salesperson once or a hundred times in our lifetime. So if you look at it instead as I'm going to help people by providing value and they will choose to pay me in return for that value, it can make it less daunting. Awesome. Yeah. And do you recommend, you know, using scripts or uh, do, you, do you think that that can be, you know, a bit wooden? I, I think it can definitely be wooden for those people who feel like they really need a guideline. I'm fine with talking points, but as soon as you get scripted, I tune you out. I don't know, gentlemen, for the rest of you, if someone, you, you pick up the phone and you can tell they're reading a script, it's like, how do I get off this call without being rude? <laughs> <laughs> so talking points much better. Even if you don't think you're a great communicator, you're going to communicate better when you're actually focusing on that person and not a script in front of you. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'd up. like to add to this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, April, you're so right here. And uh, what I've actually spotted is so many stuff. Like when you're selling, uh, it's never about the actual sale. It's about educating the client. Um, the best sale is when you, just like you said, provided value. And the way that you do this is you teach them uh, things that they don't know. And this is what really worked for me every time. Um, and it's also what works for our clients. Basically, when you're trying to sell your product, uh, whether through your website or on the phone, uh, you have to educate them about something that is relevant to them. And this definitely provides value. And also automation is key here. Uh, if you have some channels that you can automate, for example, uh, let's say that it didn't go well on your, your first call. Well, it's good to follow up, uh, but not necessarily be annoying. Uh, instead, again, provide value and just be there. Just, uh, hey, you know, uh, by the way, here's a little bit more value. And you don't do, you don't do this like uh, every day, just every week, like for two to three times, you just do a small follow-up just to see if uh, the interest is still there and then just uh, just let go. Sometimes, you know, after five calls or five uh, touch points uh, past the initial conversation, it can close. Uh, so never give up on a very prospective uh, client. 
um yeah so that's my take on it and uh, just another thing sorry um when you're trying to scale your company with salespeople, it's really important to understand that you have to uh, be the one with the hands in the mud. Um, you have to understand uh, what actually are the reactive uh, sales points uh, when you're doing your pitch, which is unscripted. Um, this is the you know the best way of doing this. And if you're gonna scale, well, someone's uh, gonna be trying to copy you. Uh, right next to you or maybe sitting inside of your call conversations and just trying to mimic you on other calls. Uh, it's also good to record the conversations of your salespeople if you do have them um, so that you can pinpoint the mistakes. And there are software for that that you can automate with. You can tag them. You can use them as a trainer calls for other uh, inbound uh, or outbound salespeople on your team. So definitely there are tools that you can check out for that. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, not yet. So Carol, Carol Duex kind of concept, like with learning, it's not yet. But yeah, I, I guess with sales or a, a no is just a not yet. So um, Jose, did you have a yeah. thought? Uh, I've got something to contribute here because especially during the pandemic and post pandemic, we had to jump on calls like this to sell. So even today, I'm getting some good clients, big businesses that want their teams retrained because once they are here, they go into presentation mode. They have kind of, if they don't have a script, they actually have all the slides that, you know, they want to take people through. And on occasions, there's only maybe two people on the call. So if they lack that ability to have a conversation that leads to a sale, okay? And I love, that's the best way to approach it in my own experience as well. That's why I teach is, at the end, you're going to help them decide or make a decision that is going to improve their lives. That is what I'm thinking about. Many people say the sales process is, you know, the numbers game. Yes, I mean, you, you just need to do a few until you get the, the hang of it. But I see it as a puzzle. So you got all of these pieces that you're putting together with a human being right in front of you, really understanding what their pains are, and to understand their needs, where they're coming from, with curious questions, and at the same time being candid. You know, no stepping back. I mean, if you want to push a little bit, see, gauge, but you're coming from a place of caring. In that way, you can really establish a lovely conversation. And with a purpose, of course, one question I always like whenever I see people, you know, it's just, well, look, just because I, I know time is important and all of the above, what has to happen for us to do business? Simple question. What has to happen here for us to do something together? And at that moment, if you build good rapport, they're going to they're tell you, well, yeah, I'm lacking, you know, I'm not sensing this, I'm not sensing that, because one of the things that happens during the sales or the sale process is the lack of trust. And that's where the objections happen because they don't trust you yet. So if you ask them, look, I sense there's still a bit of a lack of trust here. What can I do to earn that trust? How can I add another trust coin into the piggy bank for a conversation? There's loads of things, but then this happens naturally as human beings, you know, being here instead of me just you know putting all the slides and having all of them and april mentioned this having the case stories that generally will come from the founder or people that have been doing it for a while and then you start weaving in those stories and that creates natural connection and people can see clearly how they can benefit from what you've got instead of being you know pitching the benefits and the features and all of these things to them so have a human conversation, especially if you are, well, everywhere, but especially if you're in a, in a place like this, virtual. Yeah. That's no, a great absolutely. point. They're great. Well, and I think the one thing that I would be wrong if I didn't mention is we have to make it okay for them not to buy. We have to say, this may not be a good fit for you. And if it isn't, that's okay. Because what we don't realize unless we think about it when we're in their shoes is when it feels like someone is selling something to us, we feel pressurized. We feel pressure to say yes. The moment you take that pressure off, then they're choosing to stay. And, you know, you can't make a sale happen. Bob Berg, the author of The, the Go-Giver, he and his co-author, John David Mann, did just an incredible job of teaching to sell by helping. And one of the things that they say is you can facilitate a sale. You can help someone get something that they need, but you can't make a sale. So I have found, and I've been at the top of two very large sales organizations, and I have never been an ABC, always be closing person. I have been, and I think, Jose, you're the same way, always be helping, right? And, and Mark and Natan, that's what you're looking to do. You're helping 
your client, you're helping your prospects. So let's help them whether they do business with us or not. And if they don't, that's okay, because that leaves a space for the person who's going to. Beautifully said. Nitan, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Uh, I guess uh, most of the things have been covered, so I'll, I'll keep this short. Uh, only two things from my side I want to like reiterate or add. So one thing to answer your original question, yes, uh, founders should do the same because as a founder or a solopreneur, you, you do understand that uh, your product better than anybody else. So you should start with that. Uh, second, I feel that salespersons are generally good storytellers. And uh, even the great founders I, I see in the history or, or see or everybody around me, I can see that they are good storytellers. So I, I, if you are a salesperson or if you're an entrepreneur, maybe you should, uh, uh, I guess that is one of the reasons I watch so many movies. So if, if you are uh, a sales guy or, or a salesperson, I would see, uh, read a bit of stories, watch some stories and try to be a good storyteller because people may forget that what this product does, people tomorrow may uh, forget that what I do as, as, as they are an entrepreneur. But they they will remember my story uh, as 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 they go home and see that if they relate to my story, if they see uh, what my journey has been or what my product journey has been, uh, if my product has a story, then then amazing because some of the time I, I work with brands and the first question I ask everybody who, who wants to work with me that tell me your story, uh, why you have started this business. We will talk about ads, we will talk about analytics later on. But let let me understand that why you build this business not anything else so one of my I a recent client he told me one and a half hour story for their apparel product why they design the products the way they do and what is the philosophy behind it because once you understand it as a marketer once you understand it as a customer you are not going to leave that company forever you keep buying that product you keep so you know uh, suggesting or uh, voting for that product so yes, uh, to summarize, uh, yes, founders should do sale and, and storytelling is an art that a salespeople or as a founder we should focus on. Great, love it. Um, <clears throat> you happy if we m move on? Is there any, any other comments on, on, on this this piece? Are we? Okay, let, so um, it, it, we've, we've probably got about like, you know, f five, five or so minutes left, but um, I want to just like Mark, is there anything you would want to add regarding digital marketing, like spend, and because we we have touched on it through through this conversation, but I mean, um, I know that there's you know you've got so much knowledge um, in this, so yeah, what would you what would you say for people if they're now starting to get to the stage where they can do ad spend? Sure. Uh, so it's important to understand the basics because if you're dealing with companies that uh, outknowledge you, then you might pay, uh, overpay. So it's good to just know a few baselines about advertisements, uh, such as what is a CPC, what is a CPA, what is a CPL. Is there a difference between CPL and CVA? No, there's not. It's just the way that you call it. Uh, but you have to uh, kind of understand the basics so that you don't get outplayed because there's unfortunately a lot of uh, fishy uh, agencies out there and we just dealt with one that just got robbed basically based in australia they came in and they say you know they they overpaid like 10x for something so basic and uh you know it's it hurts me to see clients come through that are very genuine like human beings decent people that are trying to build a business and they get robbed but why do they get robbed it's because they don't have basic knowledge um so if you can educate yourself maybe just a little bit on YouTube or maybe on articles, it would be really nice if you're starting to spend money. Um, now, once you get comfortable with the terms, uh, the structures, uh, what is an ad, uh, ad network, why should you do A-B testing, stuff like that, you will tr try to understand and you will uh, see the efforts that agencies or individuals, uh, which are freelancers or maybe just uh, a bunch of uh, you know teams uh, would bring as an effort to you. So that is really important. Like that's the baseline. But um, once you do understand this, it's really, uh, it's, things become so clear to you. Uh, let's say that you're starting to do campaigns, uh, you will see your threshold of risk at some point uh so you would understand for example when would you need to use segments why would you need to use analytics uh or why would you want to automate your funnel what the hell is a funnel and <laughs> how do i build up a funnel uh how do i invert the funnel <laughs> you know uh, people get so confused and all of that but it, it's not that confusing once you get to read it test it um and of course you're going to burn yourself if you're starting off um there is some burning there and 
you know, you just have to accept it. Like, j just know in the back of your head that you are going to burn like 1.5K on ad spend and it's going to hurt, but it's going to provide you data. That's what you want. It's going to provide you the knowledge. And uh, from that, you can take it and build something much better, you know, in the second steps. So, yeah, like, you know, this is my take on it, basically. No, great. Love, love it. Um, does anyone else want to jump in with any thoughts on, on ad spend or? So, so uh, as Mark rightly said that uh, you should start educating yourself and, and start understanding the basic parameters of, of digital marketing. I just uh, wanted to add a bit on, on uh, how do you analyze your uh, report or how do you analyze that where you are heading. So I'll uh, give a very uh, brief example on this. So if, if today I go to a client and say that boss, uh, you got 10 sales today or maybe if you get 100 uh, followers today. Uh, for a small company uh, who is starting up, he will say, great, uh, let's have a uh, coffee or maybe beer, let's celebrate, we are uh, okay, uh, heading to a good start. But somebody who has established, he will say, what man, I mean, this is peanuts for me. So what I'm trying to say is that you need to have the right benchmarks. What What is my weekly sale? What is my monthly sale? What is my lifestyle sale? All these sales with average daily numbers, only then you will know that 100 numbers that you have added today, that 100 followers or maybe that 10 sales, is it a good number or a bad number? So when I go to my client meeting, I ask this question to everybody. So if I get to, if I get you 10 sales today, are you happy? So generally they say, okay, I'm happy, I'm not happy. Then I ask, uh, you know, the next question would be, how do you decide? Because you have to have good benchmarks, carefully selected benchmarks, and only with those benchmarks you will decide whether you are heading to the right direction or not. Mostly, I could see that people look at the numbers, but end results are mostly subjective. So if they feel good about that number, then it's fine. But if they're not, then it's not fine. So yeah, uh, numbers are good. Learn about it. But as a beginner, as, as a starting point, have the right benchmarks. Great. Um, I wanted to add, uh, I wanted yeah, to add just one little thingy. Um, when you're scaling from month to month, it's important that you try to do a 5% optimization of your CPA month over month or at least like five to 10%. The compound effect after one year is great scale. So oh. if you can just find little itsy bitsy thingies that you can change in your campaigns that can drop the cost per acquisition, you're gonna win on the long term. Long -term. So that is like the key, just small little iterations that drop the acquisition costs, you're gonna scale. Awesome. Um, couple minutes left, like Nitana, just interested, like it's almost, you know, is anything that could have ever been written out there now, you know, is, 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 as a philosophy, there's a lot of things that's been written there, like, you know, online. So you, you, you obviously look at analyzing what's trending, what resonates with people that can be really powerful for small businesses that maybe don't have the time or, or maybe don't have the inclination like to create content. So, you know, what's your, yeah, I guess like just give us a bit of an insight into that 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 exists, right? You can you can analyze certain platforms. Uh, so, like as I said, that uh, for analysis, benchmarking is good. So you can do your own benchmarking. You can benchmark your competitor. So you can start with that, and you should always choose your uh, competitor very carefully. So if you are starting out today, you cannot say that Amazon is my competitor, right? Because <laughs> that that company is, is decades ahead of you. So you have to like I ask this question to my uh, like people I meet and most of them uh, they are uh, they are not getting their competitors right. So you have to choose your competitor at the stage you are in. And once you choose your competitor, benchmark them, benchmark their content because uh, you can go to Google Trends, look at the general industry trend. Uh, there are free tools available on Vazel. Uh, you can go there, analyze what type of content working for them on Facebook what type of content working for them on Twitter, what type of content working for them on Instagram. You can do that for free. Uh, go there, analyze that, and then you will have a fair amount of idea that if something is working for my competitor, once I chose my right competitor, then this is something that I might have to look into. So you, you know, that is one of the easiest way, or I would say the first thing that you uh, would do as a uh, digital marketer or as a marketer. And the basic SWOT analysis that I guess all we are familiar with from the finance background, that should also be uh, done in the marketing uh, side as well. Once that is sorted, you will have clear pointers that, okay, this is something I need to do when, when I'm starting out. 
Right. Okay. And yes, uh, there is another free tool available. Go to ads library. There's free tool, Facebook ads library. Search any brand, you will find ads of that brand. So you know what they are advertising on, what is their messaging, what percentages of they are giving, what SKUs they are promoting. So every information is for free. You can look at look at those ads, and then you know that okay, this is these are my pointers, and this is how I I build my strategy. Brilliant. All right, thanks for that that share, Nitin. Like we'll put it into the the comments so people can go and see it as well. Um, right, you know, right at the end now. So I'd like to, um, you know, in twenty words or less, we'll just go around the room. Um, you know, what advice would you give a founder, uh, maybe me, uh, who wants to drive growth before the brand is necessarily like established? So start with Mark. Uh, Less than 20 words and less if you can. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Well, I think having uh, beautiful landing pages that actually convert because half of your success is your campaigns. The other half is the face of your website. So make sure that you wor uh, work on a very attractive landing page uh, with extremely clear uh, call to actions all above the uh, fold uh, and make sure that your mobile experience is insane because that's where 90% of your traffic is going to be. Great. Perfect. Love it. April, you're next. I would ask myself if I was the person that I am looking to sell this to and I had their challenge, what would I want help with? How would I want to be spoken to? And whether it's in person or digitally, tell the story of how you can help them and tell it well. Amazing. Thank you. Nitan? I would say relevance. Uh, find your audience uh, you want to speak to and bring relevancy to what you are offering. Once you are relevant to them, you are sorted. Excellent. Thank you. And Heze? Even from the very beginning, you have a brand because people know you for something. So reach out to these connections, ask them who do they know that you should know, and also ask them to do some introductions for you. And this is something you can apply at the beginning and you can apply all throughout. Look for stages as well where you can connect with your audience and speak. You've got stories that are related to your business, that are related to the things you can do for other human beings. Look for stages. Never stop looking for stages. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thanks so much. So look, uh, there you have it. Don't try to scale until you have a clear product market fit. Uh, your story matters. Um, so try to make sure yours is clear and resonates with your audience. Um, as Ben can come later um, to increase touch points and you know serving your existing clients and getting them to become Raven fans is key. Um, our next Wise Wednesday will be on the power of purpose. So in my personal view, that massively drives growth. So that's my experience. Um, if you have any questions, welcome to reach out to, to everyone here on LinkedIn. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to for you to do so. Um, finally, thanks to the panelists. Um, you know, you've been awesome. Thank you to everyone for listening today. And I hope you feel slightly wiser this Wednesday as a result. So thank you. Cheers, everyone. Have a great time, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Great to meet you, everybody. Bye-bye.